Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Katia Bilardo from uh, the Netherlands. And uh, it's my pleasure today to be the chair of this uh, satellite symposium organized by Toshiba. And uh, we have a very interesting program, so I hope that some more people will come because uh, if they don't, they will really miss a lot. Uh, in the interest of time, we have to start because uh, we have just uh, one hour and there are three very interesting talks. And uh, so it's my pleasure to invite the first speaker, uh, Dr. Jader Cruz from Portugal. He's in actual fact from Brazil, but uh, after having worked for many years in London at the, uh, with Kipros Nicolaides at King's College Hospital, now he moved to Portugal. And the title of his presentation will be Update on First Trimester Scan, Special Focus on the Fetal Heart. Thank you very much, Professor Villard. It's a, as I said last time, it's always an honor to be in a session where you are the chair. Oh, uh, I hope you. I am up to it, so the great honor. Um, I will talk about the fetal heart in first trimester, as Professor Bilardo said, uh, with a focus on some new technology that can uh, probably help us to assess better the heart in first trimester. So <clears throat> why the heart? First of all, because heart is one of the most, because I like it. And second of all, because heart is the most prevalent of the uh, congenital abnormalities that you can see. Even though it's one of the most prevalent ones, uh, it is among the least detected. So we have a condition that it's very common, and we are not very good in detecting at any gestation. In the first trimester, it makes it very uh, hard. It's a very challenging examination, because even, even in the second trimester, the heart is a complex moving structure. And in the first trimester, it is a small moving complex structure, so it makes it very challenging. Knowing that, Professor Nicolaides put up together an extremely nice uh, screening test for cardiac abnormalities, where you can look at markers that we already know how to look at, like the nuchal translucency, the ductus venosus A wave, and the tricuspid flow. And by looking at these markers and analyzing them, uh, you can better uh, select your high risk population for cardiac abnormalities. So you can better select the patients that will benefit from a, cardi from a specialized cardiac uh, scan. So <clears throat> what he says is that if you use the nuchal translucency above the 95th centile as your uh, only marker for cardiac defect, you will pick up about 35% of the major cardiac defects uh, and you will send to your cardiologist, about 5% of, uh, of your population. It doesn't seem much, but if you think that the method of the screening that we nowadays use is based on the histories uh, only, um, the history only detects about 10%, so it's about three times better than only history. If you include here then the, the, the ductus venosus A wave, and here what you're going to assess is the reverse A wave, not the, the PI yet, uh, you can now increase your detection rate for about 47%. And if you use together the, duct, the tricuspid flow, the, re the presence of regurgitation in the tricuspid, uh, you can end the 95th centile and um, the ductus venosus reverse A wave. You, have, you will be able to pick up about 58% of the major cardiac abnormalities for 8% uh, false positive rate. Or if you want to lower your false positive rate, you can raise your limits of the nuchal translucency to the 99th centile, where you're going to pick up about 53%, not, much of a, uh, not losing much here, and you will reduce your false positive rate to about 4%. So it's a great screening test. We all know that if you know how to do the tricuspid flow, you know how to get a nice and good four-chamber view of the heart. And if you include a normal that you are assess structurally the four chamber view of the heart and you say that is normal, then your detection rate raise up to about 75%. So it is a very nice screening test for cardiac abnormalities where you don't really need to be trained uh, in, 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 a proper, in a specific heart scan because specific training in cardiac scan, it's uh, difficult and it's long and you, we know that it's not possible to do it for everyone. So it's a, extremely useful and incredible screening for cardiac defects. But for the ones that <clears throat> like to 
look at the heart, there are some papers that uh, show us that there is room for that in the first trimester. Uh, we show here two papers, one from, uh, from King's College, from the group of Professor Nicolaidis, where <clears throat> it shows that if you look at the heart the same way you look at the heart in the second trimester, you can, you can achieve high detection rate for major cardiac abnormalities. And this other study here shows us that there is a good relation between the detection rates between the first and the second trimester. So what these two studies show us is that if you, know, if you have the knowledge and if you have the expertise and you have the proper technology for that, you are, there is room and you are able, <laughs> you can do uh, a proper cardiac scan in the first trimester. Well, when Toshiba presented me this technology, which is called the super, uh, super microvascular imaging, we call SMI, uh, I was very interested that it could be useful in the first trimester heart scan. The way it works, <clears throat> the way I represent here is not, well, uh, a very truth. It's just an easy way to understand how it works. Every time you have a Doppler, uh, your ultrasound sends a signal, and what comes back is the Doppler signal and some noise. With all the, the Dopplers that we have nowadays, in order for you to be able to see the Doppler signal, the, the software has removed the noise and also some of the Doppler signal, especially the microvascular Doppler signal. What SMI does is remove the noise and leave the, the Doppler signal in a more clever way. That's pretty much easy to understand. That's how I understand the SMI works. And this is how it looks like when you look at heart uh, 12 weeks with the SMI. So the first time I looked at it, I thought it was nice. And then I went to do a small experiment in my own, I cannot call this a study. It's, a, it's not publishing anything. It's a study I've done in my own department just to to feel how, the, how does it uh, behave. So what I have done is I pick up 50 normal 11 to 13 weeks scan, then a um, um, video of that with B mode and uh, high definition Doppler, and another video of the same cases with the B mode, high definition Doppler, and SMI. And I showed to my colleagues, four of them, and they were to say if it was normal or abnormal or they could not say something about that. So <clears throat> the result that we've got from that small experiment was that without the SMI, they were confident enough to say that the heart was normal in about half of the cases. Remember that all the 50 were normal. So in only half of the case, they were, by looking at the, uh, the, at the video, that was not a live scan, it was a video. Uh, by looking at the video with the B mode and the high definition Doppler, they were able to say that it was normal and confident to say that it was normal in half, half of the cases. When you add the SMI, even though they, they, they didn't have any specific training in SMI, this confidence raised to about 80%. So I got very interested and I went to look why, maybe if I could explain why this, this happened. So this is how it looks like a four chamber view in the heart using the SMI. You can very clearly see uh, the filling of the ventricles there, you can clearly see the interventricular septum. You see the valves here and you see the atrium, you can see some other veins as well. Uh, but you see, clearly see the, the filling of the, the, the four chambers. And what to me strikes most is the incredible visibility you can have the interventricular septum. When you move up to the outflow tracts, that's how aorta comes uh, to you. You can see the aorta coming very nicely. Here is the same video, but it's edited so it can show you better the, the aorta. And also the, the interventricular septum in the continuity uh, with, the, with the aorta, as you can see there. So it shows very nice. For the pulmonary artery, <clears throat> what strikes most is that you can see the branching of the pulmonary artery, as you can see here. Okay, you can see with a high definition Doppler, but not as often as you can see here, and I will show you in a minute there. So you see the pulmonary artery, you see the aorta crossing pulmonary artery and the branching of two. And here you can, and you can see here with the video, yeah, edited, you can see it very well. Sometimes you can even see the left branch, the right branch and the, and the duct. So it's a very clear uh, visualization of the pulmonary artery. And when you move up to the trivessel view, you can actually see the trivessel. What you see with all the doppers that you have, even the high definition one, most of the time, is the V sign. 
and sometimes the superior vena cava is just uh, merged to, to the aorta, or you, you don't see it very clearly. But here with the SMI, you can see very specifically that point there uh, that shows the superior vena cava. So it shows you very nicely. Does it really help? That's the data we have on, on a study that we are performing so far uh, on the clear assessment of the, the heart structure, and that's how it shows so far. Well, <clears throat> it didn't show up, it didn't improve very much the visibility of the four chambers view because we are all used to look at the four chambers view without any other help. Uh, we didn't consider here the, the interventricular septum as an important feature for the four chamber view. Because if you are to consider, most likely that these numbers are going to change. But we didn't, we, when we started, we didn't consider, and now we continue without that consideration. So for the four chamber view, it didn't really help very much the visibility. But when it comes to the aorta, and if you consider all the features you need to look to, 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 say, to, to, to say that it's a normal outflow tract, uh, when you use B mode plus color, we, we were able to clearly see in about 74% of the babies at 11 to 13 weeks, but with the help of the SMI, this increased to about 94%. The same happens with the pulmonary artery. It raised from 23% to 81%. And this big difference is because here we consider that for you to say that you are looking at the, the, the pulmonary artery, you have to see the branching of the pulmonary artery. So uh, we are more often uh, visible with the SMI than without the SMI. And of course, because you see the aorta better, because you are more uh, secure to say that you, you are looking at, at the pulmonary artery, you can see better the crossing. So you have an increased visibility. We are more confident in seeing the crossing of the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And the three vessel view, uh, the visibility increased from 54% uh, to about 95%. So, so far, the study that is still ongoing, it really, really helps you to, to see the structure in the first trimester. This is also very interesting because uh, this is just to show uh, some bits of our population. The maternal, mean maternal age is about 31 years. The mean BMI in Portugal is about 26. Um, and the mean CRL in this study is about 62. Um, this, when we were doing the study, we measured the distance between the probe and the heart of the baby. And we consider here, every time we could see all the specifics, that are, all, all the points that I pointed out in the previous slide, uh, with the B mode and the color Doppler, the mean distance we, are fr we, we were from the, from the heart were about 70 millimeters. And when we, inc when we include the SMI, this distance uh, the mean, the in increases to about 86%. So what we can assume here is that even the, the SMI helps you to see better the heart and also helps, helps you to see deeper, even when your B mode and your color mode doesn't help you very much. Uh, does it really help you detect cardiac abnormalities? It's too soon yet to see. We so far had only six cardiac abnormalities in our study. We, are, uh, we have a bit more now, but uh, I didn't want to bring new data. Um, this is a diver, um, heart diverticulum, a, a right ventricle diverticulum that we pick up in the first trimester with the SMI in a color mode that could show us very nicely the feeling of the diverticulum there. Uh, and this is a tetralogy of flow where you cannot really see all the features of tetralogy of flow, but you can see that there is only one big vessel, and you can see the overriding aorta here. We couldn't see, at this stage, we couldn't see the pulmonary artery, but then in the second trimester, we could make the proper diagnosis. But you could clearly see that it's an abnormal heart, and you can see here that there is a communication there, one single, uh, one big artery there, and the communication with an overriding aorta. So it is too, too early yet to say that it's going to help us to to see more of uh, cardiac defects, but it's not far to, to imagine that if you can see better the cardiac structure, more, you are most probably going to be able to pick up uh, better uh, major cardiac normalities. So in resume, for so far, uh, SMI so far improves the confidence in assessing the heart in first trimester because it improves the visibility of, first, in the fourth chamber view, the interventricular septum, uh, the aorta, the, the branching of the pulmonary artery, the superior vena cava in the three vessels, 
And it's possibly that we will improve our detection rate for major cardiac abnormalities in the first trimester. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jader. I think that uh, the pictures were really perfect, as uh, the title of this uh, satellite symposium uh, uh, says. Uh, I have a short question for you. Can you tell me uh, how much shorter the investigation was uh, by using this uh, new tool? Uh, I mean, did you notice a change in the time needed to have a full investigation of the fetal heart? Uh, I didn't really pay attention to that. I didn't um, track this, the, this as, a, as a variant. But I, um, what I can tell you is that when I have the trainees with me, but I have the residents that they, they are training there with me, um, they become much more confident in a, f in, in a shorter period of time to, to have a look at the heart. And in general, my first trimester scan takes about uh, 30 minutes. And at least it didn't change the time of my scan. Well, because uh, 30 minutes is quite a lot. Yes. There are some people who have to, to do the NUCAL and yes. uh, the uh, an anatomical survey in, uh, in less time than that. Yes. So um, it's I, I a know, very important aspect yeah, uh, to, I, to focus I, on. I, I know that I, I, I work in a, in a privileged scenario. I have a good boss that likes me and, and lets me do a lot of things. And I have 30 minutes, I, yes. Um, but I will, for next year, I will keep track of the time and I present to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent presentation. So we move to the second speaker, and is Professor Roland Axtef Liebner from Germany. And the title of his presentation is Echocardiographic Strategies to Assess Fetal Myocardial Function. Thank you, um, Professor Bilardo. It's an honor to be invited here to this um, satellite symposium of Toshiba. Um, that's okay. Oh, oh, sorry. In the past, um, two main goals were set for um, fetal echocardiography. The first one was identification of structural congenital heart disease. And the second one which, which came up um, um, more recently was the quantification of myocardial function of the fetus. We have different um, uh, techniques to um, assess myocardial and cardiac function, to assess systolic function, diastolic function, and global cardiac function. And uh, several uh, techniques have been uh, evaluated um, uh, by research teams. Uh, I will focus in the next few minutes uh, on uh, tissue Doppler techniques, um, spectral tissue Doppler, and color um, tissue Doppler imaging. And uh, I will bring you some new data um, how this can be evaluated or how can this can be incorporated into um, uh, fetal echocardiography in congen congenital heart disease. Um, in contrast to a blood flow Doppler signal, um, um, tissue Doppler signal is a signal of high intensity and low velocity, as you all know, um, and therefore you need special setups uh, on your ultrasound machine. And um, we can differentiate uh, this technique into um, spectral Doppler tissue, uh, tissue Doppler imaging, and uh, color tissue Doppler imaging. Spectral uh, tissue Doppler imaging assesses maximum velocities of uh, AV annulus, for example, and um, you can also assess time intervals of the cardiac cycle. You need um, high temporal resolution, um, and you cannot depict any deformation parameters. And this is um, a typical um, uh, um, image of a cardiac cycle depicted by um, pulsed wave tissue Doppler imaging, and by definition, S prime, E prime, and A prime um, are depicted as um, you know it from the pulsed um, Doppler imaging. And you can clearly see here that you can depict time intervals and velocities. And here's another example of um, a nice image of depicting cardiac uh, 
time intervals during a cardiac cycle using this technique. Um, we know from adult echo um, research that um, S prime, for example, corresponds to left ventricular systolic function. Uh, e prime corresponds to diastolic function, and other parameters like E over E prime ratio and um, other parameters correspond to diastolic uh, ventricular function. And A prime is also um, uh, a sensitive, sensitive parameter of um, mechanical dysfunction of the atrium. And um, we um, now looked at um, the issue of um, um, pulsed wave and uh, um, um, spectral um, tissue Doppler imaging in hypoplastic left heart uh, um, infants during gestation. And the background was that um, abnormal right ventricular function and myocardial dysfunction uh, of the systemic ventricle of this infant is an important factor of um, development of heart failure postnatally. And the long-term outcome of those babies is determined by the right ventricular function because this is the only ventricle the baby has. And we wanted to determine whether right myocardial function in those fetuses with hypoplastic left heart uh, would be abnormal during gestation already. And we wanted uh, to look at the feasibility of the different ultrasound techniques for the assessment of cardiac function. This is a typical um, image uh, of a fetus with hypoplastic left heart uh, in the subgroup of mitral stenosis and aortic atresia. And you um, see here that um, you have also endocardial fibroelastosis, which is an, um, uh, another uh, parameter of um, um, importance for the uh, long-term outcome for surgical repair. And this is um, um, uh, data of the uh, background data of the cohort of 20 fetuses um, collected over a time period of uh, two years. And um, uh, the um, assessment of, uh, um, out of uh, endocardial fibroelastosis is um, a matter of ongoing research. We used Toshiba Aplio XG and Aplio 500 with a 5 megahertz transducer. And we used uh, the techniques mentioned already. And what we saw is that uh, we have altered um, parameters um, in pulse wave uh, Doppler, in uh, higher E wave velocity, and we have um, altered uh, A prime and e, prime, e, e over E prime ratio in um, pulse wave uh, tissue Doppler imaging. So um, we have altered uh, values in hypoplastic left heart compared to normal uh, fetuses. And looking at the longitudinal data um, over gestation, we saw that um, uh, the normal increase of E over A ratio does not take place in hypoplastic left heart fetuses, and the normal increase in systolic velocities does not take place in um, comparable amount in um, the right ventricle of hypoplastic left heart fetuses. Looking at the feasibility, we um, received um, quite acceptable um, inter and intra observer vari variability results uh, for both techniques used. And um, so, uh, for this first um, study, one can say that um, we could depict um, impaired maturation of right ventricular uh, relaxation in hypoplastic left heart fetuses. And um, this was um, shown by uh, those values that I um, uh, showed to you earlier. Now moving on to color uh, tissue Doppler imaging. Um, this uses color coding of B mode. And this is an evaluation of global and regional myocardial segments within a senior loop. And this requires uh, offline analysis uh, at this time. And you can an analyze velocities and deformation parameters for every region of interest. And as this also is a Doppler dependent um, um, technique, um, the angle of insonation is important. And this is lo uh, how it looks like in uh, reality. You have the, um, the uh, color um, uh, bar over, for example, a transverse uh, four chamber U, and you depict the low myocardial velocities within uh, the free wall and the septum. And then we wanted to look at um, time intervals um, detected by um, color tissue Doppler imaging, and we uh, choose 40 uh, fetuses for this um, um, study. 
And um, this is uh, how we um, did it then. We put the uh, TDI color box over uh, the lateral ventricle, for example, the right ventricle, and then we positioned our uh, region of interest within uh, this color-coded um, uh, um, color box. And then uh, this is what you might uh, get after um, evaluation. You have the uh, velocities clearly here, the ENA wave uh, velocity and the systolic velocity. And you might also depict the uh, time intervals during the cardiac cycle. And uh, we concluded, and this is part of a, a larger um, uh, ongoing research, that um, isovolumetric time intervals can be um, analyzed precisely uh, with this technique using um, um, different uh, uh, region of interest sizes and um, that um, you, you might obviate this offline analysis with the uh, um, advantages in technology so that the ultrasound systems are capable of an automatic time interval measurements um, nearly in the future. Then we um, did um, um, a further study on color Doppler tissue imaging on hypoplastic left hearts again. And this is another um, example of hypoplastic left heart. This one is with uh, a ventricular coronary fistula, uh, which you uh, might see here uh, on the bottom of the septum. And this is again a, a bottom line um, uh, um, data of the uh, cohort, again the, the same cohort. And um, what you see is that um, again the ICT the E wave and the uh, E prime over A prime ratio are altered in hypoplastic left heart fetuses compared to normal um, uh, fetuses. And here on the right upper panel, you see um, that um, uh, in a case of hypoplastic left heart, the E wave um, is reduced and um, you have a uh, prolonged um, isovolumetric contraction time in this um, case. So, um, uh, as far to the results of this um, uh, study, the ICT was significantly higher in hypoplastic left heart fetuses. And again, uh, we have uh, some clues that the diastolic uh, function of the right ventricle in hypoplastic left heart is altered already during gestation. You can skip this because we have shown it. And uh, to conclude, um, we uh, can show that the feasibility of tissue doppler techniques in fetuses with hypoplastic left heart um, is, is possible. Um, and our results point towards an altered right uh, ventricular myocardial function uh, already during gestation. And um, this might um, be of interest because abnormalities of myocardial function after birth might have uh, their origin during gestation. And um, hopefully, we might um, confirm those um, results with um, further techniques, like, for example, speckle tracking um, techniques, with, which are uh, Doppler and angular independent. And uh, we also think that um, this might have a, a possible impact on um, um, the stratifi stratifying postnatal management uh, uh, strategies in those fetuses. Um, because um, there are some fetuses um, who are not eligible to Norwood or hybrid uh, procedure. And uh, perhaps this, um, and there are other uh, fetuses and, and, and babies who are eligible for biventricular repair after hybrid. And um, perhaps this um, data might uh, further um, shed light on this uh, issue. And also these uh, speckle tracking techniques, which um, I will uh, briefly show you here. So you, you, you get the um, strain measurements, global and um, um, regional strain measurements of left and uh, right um, um, ventricle. Thank you. Again, beautiful images. Uh, are there questions uh, from the audience? So then what I want to ask you, uh, can you inform us about uh, the reproducibility of this technique? Because yeah. we know that one of the difficult uh, uh, items in, yeah. uh, in these measurements is that so they, they are poorly reproducible. Yeah. Um, there, there, there are, um, there are um, consensus papers out, for example, for speckle tracking. Um, 
um, dealing with this um, issue of reproducibility uh, among different vendors um, um, of this technique, and they show um, that um, the reproducibility is good uh, among uh, different vendors and among different techniques. Um, and as I showed um, by our results, uh, that the inter and intra observer variability is at least as good as um, with normal um, historical uh, um, methods of uh, um, assessment of cardiac function like um, M mode or uh, PV Doppler. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a there question. Is a question there. Yeah. Uh, Elena Sinkovskaya, uh, Eastern Virginia Medical School. Um, you are applying all the new techniques, which is pretty amazing, such as the speckle tracking and uh, tissue doubler imaging. Uh, but it's very well known that uh, the main limitation application that in the fetal or echocardiography, lack of simultaneous recording of electrocardiogram. So what is your experience, how you overcome this limitation? And uh, also, I assume that you are using the cardiac uh, software, which is not always available on the OB machines. So you're using RT the system or you're using um, uh, regular OB machine? For um, the analysis of uh, speckle tracking, for example, we use an EC ECG dummy f to um, uh, overcome the, um, the problem of... Um, um, what do you mean? How so technically you do this? Sorry? How technically you do this? Uh, how technically you use? How, which technique do you use? Uh, we, 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 we do an ECG dummy on the machine and we take uh, as a baseline um, heart rate, the heart rate of the mother. And the second question is, um, what was the second one? Uh, the second one, the, the machine, it's Artido, it's Aplio. Yeah. We use Artido and we use Aplio. And Aplio, for example, is a commercial uh, available machine as well as Aplio 500 is a commercial available. But the offline analysis is with the non-commercial system to software. Oh, so you, you don't do that on the system, you do that on your computer, right? Sorry, I didn't get this. Uh, you don't do this on the machine, no, this but you is do offline. it on your computer. This offline, offline. analysis. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There is another question there. Um, what's the frame rate you use for speckle tracking and also the LV is so hypoplastic? How could you actually uh, trace the endocardium of the left ventricle in this situation? Um, no, the, the, the speckle tracking in, uh, in, in case of hypoplastic left heart, we, we, we use uh, right ventricular uh, endocardial tracking, not uh, of the left ventricle. And um, um, the, the first question was... Uh, but the frame ray used frame ray. for offline yeah. analysis. Um, we, we use DICOM, uh, um, uh, DICOM images. We don't use acoustic frame rate yet. And um, we have um, analyzed different DICOM frame rates. And um, we um, are convinced that um, a DICOM frame rate of about 80 or 100 frames or 120 frames is enough. And we compared it with lower frame rates and higher frame rates. And there's no uh, significant difference in strain um, uh, using higher frame rates. But, but in adult study, generally speaking, the frame rate shouldn't be too high rather than too low. And uh, it's about uh, 60 yeah. or so. Yeah. 60, 60, 80 is OK. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, also for the answer to, to the questions. And uh, now we move to the last speaker, which is uh, Professor Laurent Guibault from France. And uh, there has been a change to the title of his presentation, which will be Posterior False Anomalies from Clastic Lesions to Syndromic uh, Entities. Perfect. Thank you. So, uh, posture for salations uh, 
encompass a broad spectrum of entities, including isolated, syndromic, metabolic, and plastic entities. And we'll uh, focus on some specific posture force anomalies according to the anatomical approach that we published in 2006. And we focus on plastic lesions and some entities, uh, syndromic entities, including Faith syndrome, Joubert syndrome, and Walker Warburg syndrome. I want to provide you with a take home message for either prenatal diagnosis or postnatal outcome according to a recent publication in the White Journal. You know that the pathological sonographic findings leading to diagnosis of posterior anomalies can be divided in increased field field space of the posterior fossa, decreased biometry, and abnormal cerebral anatomy. We'll focus on decreased biometry with a normal cerebral anatomy, which means that there is a vermis and two hemispheres. And in that case, the reduction can be focal or global. If it's focal, which is our case, it involves one hemisphere, and you are dealing with a clastic lesion, which can be primitive or secondary. According to uh, our experience, we have to focus on the antiquity of the vermis regarding the postnatal outcome. We published this series, a large series of 26 cases of unilateral cerebellar hypoplasia in the White Journal, which is a multi-centric uh, French uh, study from our uh, National Center of Developmental Anomalies of Cerebellum. This is one case of the series. In that case, there was decreased biometry, and uh, as you can see here, the small one is more echogenic than the other. We did uh, an MR, which confirmed that one hemisphere is uh, smaller than the other one, but the important thing is that in that case, the vermis was normal, and the baby is now seven years old and has a good outcome. In contrast, this patient was referred at 28 for discrepancies between the two, uh, the two hemispheres. And as you can see, one hemisphere here is smaller than the other one, and the smaller one is less echogenic than the normal one. We did a, a subjectal view, and with the subjectal view, the, the height of the vermis is decreased. And it, it seems, compared to the control, that the fourth ventricle is displaced upward. And it's not a displacement of the fourth ventricle. It's just that the upper part of the vermis is missing. We did an MR, which confirmed the data. And you can see that, uh, in that case, the findings are more clearly uh, shown we're using ultrasound compared to MR, especially you uh, can see that on the normal uh, hemisphere here, you can clearly see the foliation, which is not shown on the small, small one. In that case, there is extension of the classic phenomenon to the vermis, which makes postnatal cognitive prognosis uncertain. And the parents elected a termination of pregnancy, and we confirmed that the upper part of the vermis here uh, was abnormal with a clastic lesion. In our series, we had four cases like that. As you can see, there is a small hemisphere here, but there is also a sort of cystic lesion facing the small hemisphere. After birth, these patients developed a segmental fascial hemangioma. And when you associated these two findings, you can have the diagnosis of a face syndrome. Face syndrome is an acronym for posterior fossa anomalies, hemangioma of the face, arterial disease, cardiac, and eye anomalies. Arterial disease are, uh, most of the time, some uh, arterial we are missing, which are missing, and especially uh, arteries for uh, the brain. And you can uh, think that if the one cerebral artery is missing, in that case, you add, we have after a small cerebral hemisphere. This is a case that uh, we saw uh, during the summer, and uh, the patient was referred to us for discrepancies between the two hemispheres, as uh, you can see here, and there is also this cystic lesion. We have long discussion about the vermis. Is the vermis normal or abnormal? There is a large mass effect of this cyst, uh, and uh, you uh, can see that what part of the tontorium is elevated. And uh, at the end, parents elected not uh, uh, choose to continue the, uh, the pregnancy. 
And uh, after birth, we did the MR, which confirmed that the vermis was normal. But at the physical examination, there is small telangiectasia on the left part of the face. And that's uh, a precursor of a segmental hemangioma of the face. So because of that, we did also an angio uh, uh, MR just to show what was the follicle of the release. And in that case, one carotid artery is missing. And this is a face anome. So just take a message about unilateral cerebral hyperplasia. Uh, the amount of surface loss for cerebral hemisphere does not correlate with poor prognosis. And UCH with normal vermis is often associated with normal outcome. And UCH may be a clue for the prenatal diagnosis of face syndrome. Let's move to uh, agenesis or degenesis of the cerebellum and first Huber syndrome. This patient was referred at 28 weeks due to vermian agenesis with a normal cephalic biometry. At this level, the, the vermis is missing, but at a higher level, at the level of superior peduncles, you can, have, you can observe this kind of image. If you turn this like that, in that case, this image looks like a molar tooth. What is the molar tooth sign? It's the, cerebra the cerebral key findings for Joubert syndrome and related disorders. This is after birth, normal superior cerebral peduncles, and in a case of Joubert syndromes, you can see that there is elongation and thickening of the peduncles, which look like a molar tooth. When uh, you move to the sagittal plane, in that case, you can see that there is thickening and horizontalization of the superior peduncles associated with a vermian at this genesis. All these findings have been reported by Denis Pugash in uh, prenatal ultrasound. This is one of the case here where you can uh, clearly observe that there is thickening of the peduncles, uh, which was confirmed on MR. But this horizontalization and the thickening of the superior cerebral peduncles leads also to modification of the shapes of the fourth ventricle. And this easier to recognize on routine examination. So we published this uh, French multicentric series. Uh, the publication was by Quarello, uh, showing that this, uh, there is a, this modification of the shape of the fourth ventricle. And this is a control on the first line here. And in that case, you see that the AP diameter of the fourth ventricle is less than the transverse diameter. Because of this elongation here, you can appreciate that the AP diameter of the first ventricle becomes greater than the transverse diameter. And a an routine examination, I think it's easier to uh, detect this kind of Joubert syndrome. What is Joubert syndrome and related disorders? It's a group of developmental brain disorders sharing a key anatomic sign, which is the molar tooth sign. It includes in the large group of CEOPATIs, which has a common spectrum of anatomical expression, including anomalies of the CNS, retina, kidneys, liver, and extremities. Uh, regarding genetics, they are mainly uh, autosomic, autosomal recessive disorders. Uh, there is many genes we described, 24, which are large, large uh, genes, and mutation is identified in half of the cases. There is a limited correlation between genotype and phenotype. And regarding the symptoms, there is abnormal breathing rhythm in the neonatal period, ataxia, ocular motor abnormalities, and variable developmental delay and hypotonia. We conducted um, a series about the cognitive uh, evaluation uh, after birth. This is a series of uh, 80 pa patients. And uh, you can uh, appreciate that there is a normal IQ in more than one third of cases, despite some specific learning disabilities, and severe psychomotor delay in less than 20% of the case. The other was mild or moderate psychomotor delay. 
Let's move to cobblestone lysencephaly associated with walker warburg syndrome. Cobblestone lysencephaly includes a spectrum of recessive autosomal disorders characterized by ocular and muscular deficits. And walker warburg syndrome is the most severe form of cobblestone lysencephaly. There are six genes responsible for two-thirds of cobblestone lysencephaly, in particular PUMT1 and PUMT2. And these are disorders of glycosylation of the glia limitans. What is glia limitans? Uh, this is, uh, this glia limitans limits neuroglial migration and it's formed as early as six weeks. And it's a mesh work of astrotide and fit attached to outer basal lamina. And these attachments are related to junctional complexes dependent on activation of the protein, which is dystroglycans, and this dystroglycan should be glycosylated to become functional. In case of hypoglycosylation of dystroglycan, it induces a, a glial limitans disruption with over migration into the peristable space, resulting in an outer hydraulic extracortical layer of new glial cells. And it leads to reduction or disappearance of the peristable space and development of ventricular dilatation related to lack of CSF resorption. And this uh, glial limited disruption leads also to a neural depletion, neuronal dysplasia of the cortical plate and loss of cortical lamination. And on pathology, there is a ratio of severity between sickness of the extracortical layer and the underlying deplate cortical plate. In infrontal space, we have also overmigration phenomenon inducing disorganization of the cerebral cortex and a severe brainstem dysgenesis, the so-called kinked brainstem, encased within the overmigration layer and preserved in its embryonic configuration. This is a paper uh, from the group of Harvard uh, showing some cases at the end of pregnancy using MR. And regarding uh, the literature, if you, you uh, have a look at uh, the uh, 10 last year about diagnosis, prenatal diagnosis of uh, Walker World Syndrome, most of uh, the authors say it's very difficult uh, to uh, diagnose this kind of uh, pathologies because the prenatal sonic findings are usually non-specific. And there is a large series in the brain uh, three, uh, three years ago uh, showing that in all index case, the diagnosis was based only on histology. We just published this paper of about the diagnosis of cobblestone lysencephaly, uh, showing that it's possible to uh, do the diagnosis. Uh, you just have to put the probe and just look at some features. So there is a specific prenatal imaging pattern in the supra and infratotal space. First, supratotal space, in that case, we fear for uh, 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 ventricular at 25 weeks of gestation. If you look carefully, there is no gyration at all, and there is a band of echogenicity, which is here. And this band of echogenicity on the surface of the brain reduces uh, the peristable spaces as shown with MR. After pathology on macro macroscopic, this band of tissue is just here, and it's correlated with the extracortical neuroglial layer. This is the case at 14 weeks, referred due to ventricular megaly and suspicion of cystic posterior fossa, and this ecologic band here is more clearly seen at seven weeks, and on coronal view here, you see this ecologic band here on the surface of the brain, which is correlated to an extracortical neuroglial layer. In the infratotal space, you have the same kind of echogenicity surrounding here the cerebellum and the brainstem here. On the sagittal view, you have this echogenicity here and here, and a small vermis with some over migration here and it was uh, also associated with the Z-shaped appearance, the so-called king brainstem, which is also uh, observed 
with the MR and with a good correlation with the pathology. So for the case we fear uh, at uh, 14 weeks of gestation, we have a cystic lesion in the posterior fossa, but when we move to a sagittal view, you can uh, clearly see that there is a abnormal band of ecogency surrounding the brainstem with a king brainstem, which is well correlated with uh, the pathological specimen. So to conclude, there is a specific fundamental imaging pattern for walker warburg syndrome based on identification of over-migration, which is, in fact, this outer hygiric band on the cortical surface in the supratemporal space, which is not identified using MR, and this ecogic band surrounding also the mesenchymal and the brainstem in the infratemporal space. So over-migration and also anatomical consequences of over-migration, which is a, is a re reduction of the disappearance of the peripheral spaces, uh, clearly demonstrate using MR, and the shape appearance of the brainstem in case within the over-migration -migra preserved in its embryonic configuration. And this diagnosis can be performed as early as 14 weeks. So thank you for your care and attention. Thank you very much. Are there uh, uh, questions for Professor Gibault? I wanted to ask you something. The, the cases of uh, prenatal diagnosis of Joubert syndrome, uh, at how many weeks uh, did you, uh, were you able to make this diagnosis? I would say that in my experience, it was uh, in the second trimester, but uh, Edwin Quarello showed me uh, a case uh, this morning and uh, he managed to uh, show this uh, molar tooth sign in the first trimester. So first trimester. I, I think it's possible. If you would ask me this question yesterday, I would say uh, after 18 or 20 weeks, but maybe it's possible in the first trimester uh, as shown by Cryolo. But I suppose the patient in the first trimester was a uh, a patient at high yes, risk. Yes, yes, yeah. because, because you don't look uh, if there is no index cases, mm. uh, I would say that uh, uh, if you want to be sure that it's a molar to sign, uh, it will be uh, in the second trimester. And you can uh, see these patients because of posture for anomalies, but also because of ecogic kinase or polydactyly, because it's a ciliopathies. So each time you have eco, uh, ecogic kinase, or uh, polydactyly, you have to look at the posterior fossa to see if it, there is anomalies of the shape of the first ventricle, which can be a clue for Joubert syndrome. Mm. Well, what you also say the, is that the counseling of these families is quite challenging. Yes, uh, there is clearly uh, no uh, clear uh, correlation between genotype and phenotype. There is some, in some genes, where uh, some of them uh, the uh, development delay is less severe than the other, and uh, the, uh, there is more or less no uh, renal impairment. But most of the time, it's very difficult to cancel because in some cases, for in the same family, you can have some uh, children which go well, and uh, some of them uh, are uh, a poor outcome with the same gene. So um, it's uh, very challenging. Thank you very much. I thank uh, all the speakers for keeping on time and you for your uh, attention. I think it was a very, very interesting session. Thank you all.